everybody, welcome to another episode of Toy Guys Talking. It's my pleasure to be talking to Nick today. Nick started a Centurions, I guess I should say the Centurions uh, Facebook group. There aren't many of them. It might be the only one, right? Um, I think it might be the only group, and then there's a, a someone started a page not that long after I started a group, I believe. Cool, cool. So it's uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you. I've chatted with you for quite a while now on that group and also on Patreon as well. So thank you very much for uh, joining and, and uh, contributing to the channel as well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. So uh, one big reason why I want to talk to you, well, I want to talk to people just in general because uh, texting is fine, but I always say, you know, talking to a person, you talk to them for 15 minutes and uh, you can just get to know them better than two years of texting, I think. Um, but I really want to talk to you about Centurions because Centurions doesn't really get enough love. It's kind of this forgotten, obscure line that, uh, you know, people think is cool, but they just never seem to get brought up when all of the classic 80s toy lines get brought up. No, I definitely agree on that one. It is a very obscure toy line. And most people are not even familiar familiar with the cartoon all that well. And I think it's because of the uh, Iran syndication. And every network ran it at the most oddball time slots. Uh, do you remember? A on my, do you remember when it was that? first on? Yeah, actually, I do. Um, okay, because this I is cool info to, for me to learn. Because when Centurions were coming out, I, I didn't know about the cartoon. I may have caught it here or there. But I'd love to know more about like when the cartoon was on. Um, you know, some of the stuff behind it. Um, my first exposure to it is kind of a, to me, a funny story. Um, do you remember the old TV guide magazines that you can get subscriptions to back in the yeah, 80s? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going through it and we had a local syndicated channel called channel 61 WQVC or something like that here in Cleveland, Ohio. And there was a black and white ad for, Centurions advertising it next week, you know, Monday through Friday at whatever time slot. And it's the, it was kind of like the picture that's on the banner of the page where all three of them are lined up. And, uh, you know, with their arms out like they're re about ready to get their exosuits added on. Power oh. extreme. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this cartoon looks kind of interesting. And then on the next page, you know, for the following week, there was an advertisement for Rambo, Force of Freedom. And they were both Ruby and Spears, like, right? Yeah, and uh, so I, you know, I set the the VCR to record it, and I still own that. I still have it in my possession. That VHS cassette taped off the, uh, you know, the TV with the original five episodes. But in my area, the time slot changed, and that was it. I I never caught any of the rest of the episodes until probably until YouTube or uh, Boomerang actually. Yeah, when mm. Boomerang started airing it, and then when the DVDs became available, I looked them up right away. Yeah, it was. There's a lot of fierce competition in the '80s. Uh, Sunbow, obviously, probably the you know for most people the the front runner for animation. That was GI Joe, Transformers, and then even later on with Gem and Humanoids. And then there was Filmation with He-Man, She-Ra, and Brave Star. And uh, kind of trying to keep their head above water, it seemed to me, was Ruby Spears, which was putting out some really beautiful looking animation with uh, Rambo and Centurions and. Probably a bunch of other ones I'm not think, uh, remembering right now. Deke was in there too with Ghostbusters and a few other things. But Ruby Spears looked great. Um, the thing is, like, I love Centurions. Um, the cartoon is really fun to have in the background occasionally, but to sit down and try to, like, follow a bunch of episodes, it never to me really seemed to have, um, you know, the flow, the cohesion that the Joe, like, two parter or five parters had. Uh, no, definitely not. Uh... It was to me. They were great. They were still great to watch as an adult, but yeah, they didn't flow together as well. But ironically, episodes would tie in with each other. But it's it was odd because like they mentioned the episode of C Lab where their weapon systems were built. Yeah, and then, like, there was continuity. Later, yeah, ten later, ten ten episodes later, it was brought up and attacked, and you know what I mean. Then I think like five episodes later it got taken over or a new location and it was referenced again so it, it was like you said it, it didn't flow together all that well but it was kind of like a marvel comic book series where it was brought up and then years later 
it, like you know, you know, because back in the day, Marvel would write down previously mentioned in issue like one forty seven of the right. Spider Man, and you got to go to the so, comic shop and hunt that one down. Now it's like, where's the issue forty seven? Exactly, but unfortunately, they didn't kind of do that. We're told you episode twenty two. You know what I mean? But yeah, you couldn't just, look it up on Tubi. All, you would get lost. Yeah, absolutely. And the other, the interesting thing about Centurions to me, it's it's a lot better than Rambo. I've watched some Rambo recently, Force of Freedom. And it's hilarious. I mean, it's it's entertaining in a different way <laughs> than I think it was intended. Um, Centurions is better than that. Uh, but the interesting thing about Centurions, like the voice acting is awesome in Centurions. I just find with a lot of the episodes, a lot of it is, uh-oh, there's trouble. Crystal, beam down, wild weasel. Power, extreme. And then he uses it for 30 seconds. I'm going to need Hornet, Crystal, recall, wild weasel. So it like a you know if any cartoon really suffers from the commercial itis that they claim all the commercial uh, the cartoons had i think centurions has that a lot it felt like the um maybe the toy company was telling them you need to include you know at least one scene with detonator or one scene with orbital interceptor you know regardless of if the story requires it or not but what i thought was really cool about centurions that a lot of the other cartoons don't have and and big reason why i recommend it Check out the continuity uh, of like the weaponry. Like when Jake fires the rocket on um, Fire Force, it's empty until it gets recalled. There's no like magical respawning missiles. Stencil missiles fire. Once he fires those missiles, they're gone. And that's one thing that I always notice. Like, wow, they're really keeping track of like ammunition and not respawning it magically. I was really, really impressed with that as well. Uh, watching that and then I had the opportunity because uh, one of the fellow admins in the group actually has I, I we call it the Centurion's Bible it was given to the all the writers back at Ruby Spears for when they were developing the storyline and it had like okay this is orbital interceptor each weapon is listed as this please note orbital interceptor only has two missiles so when they're shot they're gone yeah. uh, so that was actually written for the writers to keep track of which that, is really interesting uh, so that was Kenner's it, direction you know, uh, yeah, it was, I, to my knowledge, I didn't get a chance to fully read the whole book, you know, cover. It's, it's really just a binder that was, all the pages were printed off, put together and given to the writers. So I didn't get to read it, you know, from beginning to end. Cause it, like I said, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to one of the admins in the group. And, mm -hmm. uh, the few things I did caught though. Yeah. It had a uh, contribution from Kenner and the writers. And it's just, it was, it, it was like all of them together compiled this thing together. And, uh, Whose direction was that? It was Kenner or not? I don't know, but man, that was just great writing, though. You know what I mean? To make note that this missile's been fired, it's done, it's over, you know? Uh, well, a big thing about all those 80s toy lines and cartoons was attention to detail. So G.I. Joe was all about attention to detail. It was, it was, they were models more than toys. Um, and Centurions was all about that, too. So uh, the few episodes that I caught as a kid, I definitely remember thinking, like, Oh, he's only got two stencil missiles and they would actually use that, you know, as limited as they were with got to sell the toy. They actually used it to their advantage, which was cool. So when um, Ace was in Sky Knight um, and he would fire the stencil missiles, now he's got the bomb and then that's it. Right. I'm, I'm out of firepower. Mm -hmm. And that would create a lot of drama like for a kid watching this going, but he's, he's only got one shot left and now he's got the piddly little laser. What good is that going to do? So then when he calls up, uh Oh, you know, I need sky bolt like, Oh, now it's on. Now it's on. He's got another, like, you know, <laughs> he's got a lot of firepower now. I, I kind of thought it was great. It kind of built character for kids to teach them make do with what you got. Yeah. So yeah. you got two of these, you make them count. If yeah. you're not going to get, you know what I mean? You're not going to always get a, uh, you can't use the, I like to joke, you call it up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, contra code the to contract. get more limited weapons. <laughs> this is what you have. Use it. And they did a great job at that. They really did. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the one in a million shots, you know, this one's got to count. And they would they would actually give a moment for the guy to aim and, you know, be concerned and, and make the audience feel like, hey, you know, if he doesn't get this, in the grand scheme of things, it would be okay. I mean, all Crystal had to do was beam down a new weapon system, right? So, you'd think. but they're they're trying to do the best they can. Um, did you have any Centurions growing up? Um, honestly, no. The yeah, nobody uh, did. My, <laughs> the kid, actually, the kid, uh, my neighbor, uh, 
I'm trying to remember. There's uh, Kevin. That, that was a, one house over for me. He had Ace McLeod. And to me, I was like, oh, my. You got Ace McLeod? And to him, it was like, yeah, this is some stupid toy that was given to me for Aww. my birthday. But he let me play with it every time I came over. And I, I, I loved it. I idolized it. And uh, I always wanted them. And with my mom, we always went to uh, – every Saturday was grocery shopping, pick up medications for my dad. And when we were at the pharmacy, it was uh, – they they had the Centurions in the, in the little toy section. In the pharmacy, wow. Every Saturday, I wanted them, but – I would have to wait till I got to, you know, in my uh, late twenties to finally get them, you know, to get one for myself. Yeah, I didn't have one until, you know, much much later, probably like ten years ago. I think is when I got my first one, and really? uh, luckily I kind of I snuck right in there and was able to pick up a whole bunch of vintage stuff before you know the price really skyrocketed. The mint and box ones now on eBay are insane. Like they're hundreds of dollars for a mint and box uh, of the original three guys, or or even you know the um, the bad guys too, the uh, terror and hacker. The, the prices on them have gone insane on them. I, I'm still, I, I mean, I've completed my collection years ago. You know what I mean? So when someone posts uh, or makes a comment of how much is it worth, and people start telling them, and I look it up on eBay, I'm like. Wow, this is crazy. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> I, I don't want to know how much they're worth. Um, so, I mean, I keep tabs on eBay for newly listed items just because I like to share among the group of, hey, if you're looking for this, right. here you go. Help people but out. I never keep tab of what sold and for how much they sold. I never keep tab of that until recently, and I was like, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, it, it is crazy. Now, I, I lucked out, and... Um, it wasn't the case for Ace, but for Max and um, Jake, the way I got them was some seller in China must have found like a big uh, box, just like a giant or boxes of unsold stock from Kenner. And so when they listed it on eBay, it was one of those, buy it now for 50 bucks. Quantity was like over 10. So yeah, so, so you know, I'm so frugal that, at whatever it was, if it was 50 bucks, I was like, Ooh, that's expensive. <laughs> that's so much. Like in my mindset, even, even that many years ago, I was like, that's too much for a toy that was 10 bucks or 12 bucks or something. So I only got one. Of course, hindsight is 2020. Why didn't I buy 10 of them? But that I've never been that way. I don't, I don't regret it. I'm just grateful that I got like the one max mint in box and the one Jake mint in box for that price all those years ago. Um, and when I bought them, I thought this is probably a scam, probably too good to be true. Who could have that many, but it turns out they did. I mean, they, they found some boxes somewhere. That was an amazing story, actually, man. Wow. That is, uh, that's luck right there. Finding that one, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I was able to get ACE a little while later. So the, the Jake and the, uh, Max I have are, are perfect. Like they're case fresh. They were never on the shelf. Um, and then the ace, you know, obviously I wanted the ace right beside them. And that one I had to wait a little while longer for. And I ended up getting one from Japan, which wasn't in a Japanese box. It's just in an American box. Happened to come from Japan. Uh, and that one was like twice as much. Uh, and it had shelfware. So that one hurt. That was like, ouch. Ooh. But you never saw J uh, ace, even back then, you never saw ace mint in box. So, you know, I just wanted to have the three of them on the shelf. You know what's funny about the boxes, and I didn't realize it until about like a couple of years ago. I always thought the boxes for those were really, really odd and weird. But then it occurred to me, wait a minute, they're in their beaming position for the weapons to be added on to them. If you look at how they're displayed, oh, they're wow. like ready to do the power extreme, and the weapons are just floating right around them. And I'm like, this is brilliant packaging. And I just now realize that on the original three. And I never realized that. I just realized it now. That is awesome. I'm just looking back at them, and wow. That is that is brilliant. It, it sure takes up a lot more uh, real estate space than it needed to, but that's what I love about a lot of '80s toys. Like you remember the Sectars, the hand puppets. Oh yeah. Remember <laughs> the, the Dargon and the Spydrax and the giant boxes they came in. So they could have easily had the wings detached, had the figure not sitting on the thing, and had it in a box a quarter of the size. But you know, '80s was go big or go home. So you got this giant box. Same with the Centurions. 
I'm actually surprised the USS flag didn't come assembled in a box just so that they could sell a nine foot long box and say, there you go. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that would have been, I don't think anyone would be able to fit that one home to get, you know, to get that one home, you know, in the box. Like that. That's what the that roof, been nice. that's what the roof is for <laughs> or a trailer. Uh, so, True, or minivan. so in your Centurion's collection, is it complete now? Yeah, no, my collection, uh, I got lucky on it. I had, I bought the original three many, many years ago from a local toy store. Uh, big fun. They close sense. But um, then a few years later, I, I, I knew one of the employees and he kept telling me, hey, look, man, we got a bunch of Centurion's on way on the top shelf. And they had some really tall shelves. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So when I had a chance, I went down there, and he pulled out the 18-foot ladder, went all the way to the top, and pulled down all these boxes. And it turned out to be a complete set of all the Centurions with their boxes. And wow. uh, he gave it to me at a I, – I don't want to really disclose the price, but he gave it to me at a really, really insane deal. So and I like, the original three – I like that you don't talk – I like that you don't talk about prices just like me because, you know, I, it just, it takes the fun away, you know, from me. It, it, and I know there are a lot of people who love to talk just about the price and there's, there's groups and pages and channels for them. Uh, that's, that's not really my thing. You know, I want to focus more on the toy. So I like that you, you know, aren't all about, you know, it was this exact amount, which is, you know, increased and I've, I'm making this much of a profit if I sell it. I like that you just appreciate the toy for the toy instead of looking at it as an investment. Yeah, I, it's never been about an investment to me. It's always been about the toy. And even when I resell, uh, I, we have a local community of collectors around here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to give them a plug or not. but uh, Oh, go for it. Here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a two groups, actually. We have Joe Ohio, which was started as a small G.I. Joe collectors group for the Cleveland area. Uh, but a little more south Cleveland suburb area. And then for general Cleveland, we have Neotech, Northeast Ohio Toys and Collectible. That group has got about a thousand members. Most of them are local Cleveland members, and we meet once a month, and it's a miniature toy swap show. Oh, that's awesome. And it, it's it's great, man, because you can post stuff for sale, pick up in my area or wait to the meeting. And they're, like I said, everybody's generally within an hour drive away. And whenever I sell, I sell dirt cheap because it's it's I, I i believe in toy karma if i found it at a good deal the karma must be passed on upon somebody else to find it at a good deal so i always sell myself dirt cheap just to you know what i mean just to get rid of it and i want someone to be happy like oh look what i got at this price it's, it's a crazy deal thank you you know i just i get happy seeing that i don't know i'm weird you know good good on you i don't think it's weird at all i think that's just a good heart good soul and and uh you know good for you man you're a good brother I just love hearing that. That's awesome. Um, with that uh, group, I wish there was something like that in this area. Do you guys have to like pay in every time you meet, like a, a admission price? No, no, it's all oh, free. Um, so lucky. It started with a good couple guys, and we would have it at someone's house, and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, that's and awesome. we're lucky. I think they do it at a local. Um, I don't know if you have uh, BW3s in your area of Canada. Uh, it's a Buffalo Wild Wings, and they got mm. a party room. I don't, not in my part, I don't think. Okay. Well, we, we were doing it at various restaurants. Now we do it at a, a Buffalo Wild Wings, and we have a they have a party room that they they let us have once a month. And uh, they get a lot of money, obviously, from us collectors coming in there because they got alcohol, wings, and all that stuff. Yeah. So we come in, we get dinner. And we set up the tables. It's a swap meet, uh, and the admins do this every month and organize it. So uh, it's it's a big turnout. And no, we don't charge. They they don't charge anything. Uh, oh. No admission, no nothing. If you want to make a donation to the group, uh, if I remember correctly, they'll use it and they run fundraisers for local charities like Hunger for Harvest or Make a Wish or something like that. They, or for a local family in need, they'll raise money and buy a bunch of groceries and all that. So. That's the only time they'll ask for money if if you want to make a donation for something. Oh, that's awesome! What was their their name again? Uh, Neotech Northeast Ohio Toys and Collectible. And they're on Facebook. Yeah, they're on Facebook. So okay, if uh, you're in the Ohio area, definitely check that out. In southern Ontario, uh, right. southern Ontario where I am, uh, they do some retro toy shows every. It seems like there's one every month or every other month. You know, somewhere in the Toronto area. 
uh, or even in my town, out past to Woodstock, London, Ontario. But they're toy shows. They require admission. And uh, we're not so lucky. We don't have like collectors get together groups here that are free and just people get to, you know, do a swap meet and hang out. So that's very lucky you got that. I'd love to see something like that happen in Southern Ontario. So if any, uh, uh, like, uh, Southern uh, Ontario Canucks out there are listening, eh? Uh, let's, let's get something rolling here. Let's get the, let's get the bar rolling, you hosers, eh? Cause that'd be a lot of fun. You'd be amazed at how many people might turn out of the woodwork for that one. Uh, we have so many collectors here that it's funny when the meet, as the unions got bigger, I would go in and I would look at somebody like, wait a minute, I know you. We used to work with each other about 10 years ago. You're a toy collector? <laughs> They're like, yeah, Marvel Legends and GI or Transformers. You? G- well, G- everything. You know what yeah. I mean? And, uh, so, yeah, there, you might be surprised if you, you try to, you know, get one going like that and, po- you know, post in the local uh, groups because, I mean, there's local buy-sell groups in my area discussion groups post something like that in there you might be surprised at how many collectors you have in your area and and toy collecting you don't even have to be a like a a huge collector and a fan i mean so many people grew up on it and i think as we get older our age group you know guys who grew up in the 80s um you know even if we don't own anything we grew up on it we remember it we appreciate it we're you know a lot of us are starting to realize that stuff was special uh, and it's the great unifier. Like uh, uh, last week I was talking to Mark from build a and he said he's got uh, a friend who the only thing they have in common is G.I. Joe. And I thought, well, that's enough. I mean, that's all you need. That's literally all you need. So if you've got a buddy and you think, oh, all we have in common is Centurions, that's all you need, man. I mean, what else would you want in common? Um, you know, a, a, a fandom of peanut butter. Like, what's cooler than you know a certain toy line that you can go so deep, deep dive with all the characters and all the adventures they had, and the comics maybe if they had the different toys and stuff. I mean, that's that's plenty of stuff to talk about and come up with you know ideas and reminisce and stuff about. It's the greatest topic and you know you can have to share with anyone is talking about your toys your childhood your memories you know uh i i can't think of anything better to you know to have, you know to do with people you know yeah like Talk when toys. yeah i'm not i'm not a sports fan and, and not throwing shade at, at sports fans at all but uh when i was uh you know in high school i was watching some sports and hanging out with some sports friends and talking sports and after a while it, it got really repetitive for me and it wasn't, it just seemed like to my buds, it, it wasn't getting repetitive. So after about two or three years, it was like the same conversation over and over again. Did you see T. Mussolini when he, da, 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 or whatever. And, and I was like, haven't we had this conversation like eight times <laughs> in the past two years? <laughs> so that's when I, uh, you know, got a little bit more proud about comics and cartoons because, because the sky was the limit with the with the creativity and and like back then we were doing the stuff that all the movies are doing now like the what ifs the crossovers like marvel uh avengers endgame that's the type of stuff i was talking to my comic buddies about back in the day like what if you know thanos and everyone got together i just find that really a lot more interesting than talking about how the team could have played better last night isn't it kind of interesting how the times have changed, though? Um, I'm 42, and I remember being younger in junior high, being a comic books fan. Kind of people like looking at me and kind oh, of like yeah. a little snobbish, like you're, uh-huh, you're a yeah, nerd. Comic books. Yeah, you're you're a nerd. And now they're going on opening night to see Avengers, and they love all the Marvel movies. It's like that magic is I that the that magic that you're seeing is I had love for that way back then, and now you're just you know, yeah. shown the love for it. It's like, it's interesting how the times have changed on that. I'm know? so happy I've lived long enough to see that happen. Cause I mean, there was always that geek or nerd stereotype of you are less than, uh, you are, you are less than everyone else. If you are, you know, you like that stuff, you're looked down upon your thought less of, uh, and too many, way too many people in the world, uh, tolerated it and took it, took it to heart and uh stopped loving what they loved maybe they even stopped breathing because they just they couldn't stop loving what they loved and they just decided to not go on because of the people who were trying to diminish them 
um, I've always been one to push back and say, yeah, I absolutely w love what I love. And then I would sometimes say, like, what do you love? What? Tell me what you love. Because uh, it gets a little touchy with those people when uh, you want to know some personal stuff about them. And, uh, you know, they don't want to give that up because they're afraid that you're going to do to what they love the same thing that they just did to what, you know, you love. So you know, I always just tell people, it's that old expression, when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. If anyone ever gives you a hard time about what you love, well, you look into them and uh, you might find a person who's not all that proud about what they love. And if they are, if they're like, well, I love hockey. Okay, let's talk about, it. you don't want to get into like a, you know, like an ignorant, um, you know, fighting contest about, well, the thing you love sucks. But it's, it's just, uh, you know, a lack of perspective. It's a lack of empathy. And it's important to remind people, hey, you know, I could just as easily uh, take a crap all over what you love. And let's see how you like it. Oh, you don't like it? Well, then don't do that to other people. Just go love what you love and keep your mouth shut. It's the way I look at it, man. Everybody... Have, just respect each other, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Plain and simple. If you like it, you like it. You know, uh, I work with people. I got friends that are into some, uh, I, I, to me, I don't want to use the word odd, but there is some stuff that I'm not into. It's like, you love firearms. That's fine with you, man. You're a big sports guy. You're, you're fine. That, that's fine. You know, it's, if I'm, you know, me and my coworker will be talking Marvel legends and, you know, people kind of look at us funny. Like, man, you guys are so weird. I'm like, how do you think I feel when you guys are talking about your fantasy football draft? There you, you go. Know I mean, and who's runner up or who's this? And it's like, I, I, I have no idea how that works. But to me, it's just like, it's so kind of odd hearing it because I, I don't understand it. But it's it's what you like. I'm not going to knock it. Just yeah. enjoy what you like in life. You know? yeah. <laughs> have you ever taken a shoe off and said, walk a mile? Walk a mile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's funny. Uh a lot of people say, you know, it's when you actually get to do it, you know what I mean? With my employment, I, I, I had to once, and I did walk a mile in some of the other people's footsteps, and it's like, wow. What you guys got to deal with and what you have to, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I underestimated. I have a whole new level of respect, and that was good. You know, after that, I try to look at life in general like that. Just yeah. don't assume. Just appreciate what, they, you know, let them enjoy what they have and just be happy for them. You know? absolutely tough tough thing to do but it, it can be done i mean just like anything with training with focus and with intention it, it can be done but you know if a person is very far off from being like that to begin with it's going to take a lot of dedication and and focus to say to actually admit and go hey that's wrong what i'm doing is wrong you know telling somebody you suck because you like this thing that i don't like you know, not too many people want to look in a mirror and go, hey, that guy really sucks. You know, he's got to change his ways. He's got to try harder to be a better human being and respect other people. Yeah, and maybe those people just didn't, like, stick around to the end of the cartoon episodes and I learn think the so. moral of the story, like <laughs> He-Man or uh, Silverhawks and G.I. Joe. Uh, they always had the good moral at the end of the story. People like that, they just didn't stick around for that far in the cartoon. Or they're, they're Cobras or Decepticons at heart, and they they always booed. Oh, I'm turning this off. The Cobra's lost again. <laughs> now, I see... wondered why Cobra or Decepticons never had a PSA announcement at the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> that actually would have been a great idea, um, you know, just to deal with some of the D-bags, you know, who people who would grow up to be, be D-bags later on in life. Now, in today's episode, we've got our tails kicked by G.I. Joe. But don't take it to heart. Come back stronger. <laughs> like some sort of inspirational, we will overcome and rule the world. <laughs> Have Destro come in, learn your tactical advantage. <laughs> no history. Hey, Rasputin once fought that because he did this. No history, and you will not fail. You know, relive Cobra Commander's defeat. You know? <laughs> just That'd because be just because we lost the battle doesn't mean we didn't profit. We made a good profit. <laughs> and he shows you some like figures, and <laughs> we made lots of money. Prizes doing one, or you know, the Crimson Guardsman. Even though Cobra lost, we still made money off the weapons they used, <laughs> proving that in it. In any situation, you can be, oh, you can win. <laughs> See, that's the type of stuff I used to talk about, like back in, you know, when I was a kid or in high school. That's exactly what we would be talking about, you know, just joking and having a good time. Um, I noticed behind you, you've got a very pretty ship. It is the USS Flag. When did you get that? Um, 
early 2000s. I was at a, I remember, it's a great, to me, it was a, it's a fun story for that one. I was at a toy show, and this was before I had the, you know, like eBay and all that really kicked off and became popular. Mm. I was at a toy show, and they, uh, there was a seller by the name of G.I. Dan, and, or, or G.I. Dean, G.I. Dean, I'm sorry. G.I. Dean. And he sold me a uh, G.I. Joe, I'm thinking uh, Eagle Storm. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I got two more if you're interested. They look great on your flag. I'm like, oh, I don't have a flag. You need a flag? I'm like, yeah. Oh, I live who, like. Who doesn't? He was like 30 minutes away. I went to his house and bought it from him like the oh. next weekend. And I was oh. like 2002, 2003 maybe, you know. That's amazing. I don't think I've had mine as long as you. It's been a few years, um, but uh, every time I look at mine, like I always tell people when they ask me, what's the one thing in your collection? The one thing that you just, you never get tired of. And I always say the flag, like I never ever just stop being amazed by how ridiculous it is. It is just, it shouldn't exist. <laughs> and no, it does. No. So you've had it even longer history. now. Uh, you know, same feeling for you. All these years later? Yeah, absolutely. And if you actually take, you know, look into the history of the behind the scenes development of the flag, because I got a lot of guys that are really into G.I. Joe and know a lot of the odd trivia of behind the scenes and how it was made. And when you look at the history and how that thing came to be, you really just look at it like, wow, I right, man, it's just something you got to appreciate. It's just insane. Fill me in a little bit. I don't think I know much about how it came together. Um, other than they were making so much money, they decided to do something absurd. Well, I, I don't want to be, I hate for someone to quote me because I might have, this, you know, some of the facts mixed up, but from, like some of the things I remember. Okay. Uh, just a disclaimer here. This is fantasy. This is all fantasy. So <laughs> there you go. You're, you're yeah, good. <laughs> this is word of mouth. Okay. Um, uh, like when they were proposing the flag originally, I think it was a 12 foot mock-up they had of the flag or like nine to 12 feet. And the higher ups came in. They're like, "Oh, this is going to be a nice toy fair display." They're like, "No, this is something we want to make." And they're like, "What?" It's a playset. You know what I mean, yeah, the play. They're like, "You want to make a playset this big?" And they're and they're like, "Yeah." So when they finally kind of, they're like, "Okay, prove that you can do it." And they're and you know, and it came down to they're going to have to make it seven and a half feet in size for packaging, fit in on the box, and you can supposedly slide it underneath a child's bed. So they oh. figured seven and a half feet would be the good size. Okay. You know, detach the tower, slide under, underneath the bed, which we all know as a flag owner, that's not happening. No. <laughs> it ain't moving once you get it out on the ground. Yeah. Uh, um, and then I, if I remember correctly, it was paid by the financing department. It came out of their budget to get the flag done. And the flag had to be done pretty much on, I don't want to use the word overtime, but a lot of designers worked off the clock past hours to get the flag done because it wow. wasn't originally in the that year's budget at all money wasn't you know like i said the money had to be pulled out of financing to get it done so and then even the original like the, the flight deck it wasn't even made by hasbro they contracted that through a local company that made swimming pools hmm. because if you look at the plastic of the flag it's fiberglass hasbro couldn't produce anything that thick and that rigid so that was actually like i said some some contract into a company that made swimming pools yeah it's a totally and different then, material it's like it, it's almost like bathtub or shower fiberglass exactly it's pool material it, it, literally and then there was a problem the original flight decks were black and then they had to rent a warehouse spray paint them uh gray or yeah literally they had the employees spray painting them gray uh, on the first couple that were produced. So there are variants out there, supposedly, that if you scratch them, you can actually reveal black plastic underneath them. Uh, I don't know how rare those are, and I, I don't know how much truth is behind that, but I remember hearing that from multiple sources that a lot of them were spray-painted, uh, you know, gray because they were black, and uh, just a lot of kind of oddball stuff like that, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, you know, it's like I don't want to separate. I, I don't want to be giving out false information because – I'm not sure exactly how much of it is, is true, you know? Well, who knows what, what, if anything, is true. I mean, even people who worked on some of this stuff don't remember things. They've done interviews. I've seen them do interviews where they'll, where they'll say something, and the interviewer's like, uh, but actually it's, no, it's this year. And the guy's like, no, I'm 100% positive. Hey, buddy, I worked there. I worked at Hasbro. And the interviewer's like, um, this is awkward. It was actually the following year and it was the following year. And the, and the employee isn't remembering, right? Because 
the years just have an effect on <laughs> on us, right? It's been what thirty plus years, you know. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, I would be definitely mi- mixing up dates. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, we've said toy collectors have said for a long time we'll never see anything like the flag again, right? That was the that was the pinnacle of the big ridiculous playset, <clears throat> and then we see some stuff coming out recently, like that new Snake Mountain, the classic Snake Mountain Unicron, Haslab Unicron, the Sail Barge. Um, and it start, you start to think like, are we in the next few years going to see something bigger than the flag? You think? Yeah, but the, rule, the rules change though. You know what I mean? Back then it had to be either Toys R Us or Walmart that was going to sell it. Right. Now these companies are like, like Super 7 and, or even Mattel when they started it with, you know what I mean? We're selling it directly yeah, direct, selling it directly on their website, avoiding the middleman. So there's no and risk. And with Brace for All doing a crowdfunding, it, it, yeah, like it, it brought down the risk and gave us the possibility. So who knows? Maybe Haslab might one day pull off a, a flag. You know what I mean? But I, I have a feeling it wouldn't be the same flag. It would probably be a whole entirely different redesigned flag. You It'd know, have to and. Be. Uh, and I personally wouldn't want them to produce the original flag because I have a feeling it might be cheaper to get a vintage flag than it would be to buy uh, buy a new one. You know, what I mean that had to be completely retooled by scratch. Yeah, I you know I'm fine if they reissue if they because I love the flag so much and for years I've been telling people this thing's incredible. So if they were to reissue it, I'd be happy for all the people who get to experience the same or almost the same flag that I've had and you've been able to experience for years now. Of course, it's modern materials and modern engineering. It might not be as sturdy, but, you know, it's it's still like a reissue. It'll it'll still make you feel good. You know, it's there are some people who look at a reissue and they go, nope, it's horrible. It's terrible. It shouldn't exist. But then there's some people who look at a reissue and go, oh, it's just like the one grandma bought me. So <laughs> who, who are we to, to tell them that feeling, that nostalgic, loving feeling you have of your grandma? That's wrong. You shouldn't have that. Like, that's never made any sense to me. No, and it's like when the uh, retro Star Wars figures came out, all the amount of people complaining about that. It was like, man, just. Did you buy your toy because you loved it, or did you buy it for an investment? You know, exactly. I mean, just let it go. You know, and it, it's uh, and it reveals like who who did what for what. I mean, that's a that's a great you know revealer. I think. Uh, I think if they ever do make something bigger than the flag, it should be the flag though. Like it should be a Haslab USS flag, and make it nine feet. What if they use the original design that they couldn't back in the day? because Hasbro told them you have to make it a little smaller. That'd be a heck of a hook, actually, if they said... That would be. Now, it's the flag. It's as you remember, but bigger. It's as it should have been originally, initially. So that might be a way to skirt around. Um, and I never say, you know, keep those people, the complainers, happy, because they're the, they're the minority. You know, they're like any complainer. They're in the vast minority, but they're very loud and abrasive. And so people get conned and fooled into thinking that their opinion matters more than the vast majority that's respectful and quiet and graceful about it, that they just go, whatever, you know? So, um, I, I, but that would be a good way to kind of, you know, the, the people who own the original flag can feel like, oh, I still got my original flag and, and they're not reissuing it. But then the people who are getting the new one are like, you can have your original one. I've got, I'm getting the nine foot one that's almost the same, just longer and bigger. Yeah, I'm just trying. I, I I I couldn't help but stop and think and look at my toy room. I'm thinking, man, they go anything over seven and a half feet, ain't fitting in this room. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. It, the flag as it is barely fits in my room too, and it's on wheels, and it's it's really awkward to move around whenever I'm doing shoots in here. I'm like, where does the flag go now? And let's wheel it over here. Like, it, <laughs> it's so huge. But I would hope that if they ever did a new flag, that they would put wheels on it because the thing. How do you make a seven and a half foot long toy three and a half three feet or three and a half feet wide that doesn't move? Yeah, well, that, like I made that comment earlier that it was supposed to be you, you slide in underneath a kid's bed, and I'm like, you, like I said, if you want a flag, you know that structurally you can't slide that on the carpet. It's not going to happen. No, the, all know? the trusses will break underneath. Exactly. And it's know? kind of funny, like the design of it. Even for the time, I mean, I don't see that plastic ever being sturdy enough to handle the weight of that whole thing. Like those thin, brittle trusses underneath, even in 1985, they were snapping. 
from from yeah, they were. like how this thing was designed those trusses should have been designed out of the same material as the deck really yeah uh they, you'd think they would have and I, I i wish i understood and knew why they weren't but hey, i guess it's one of those mysteries you know what i mean i guess no one really thought that we'd be keeping it so the years later and you no. know what i mean no that's true. Be a holy grail yeah it was yeah. like i mean that's probably a big reason why so many of the toys of the 80s have so much value now because it was kind of the disposable decade where it's like eat your big mac and throw the package and you know just throw everything out when it breaks throw it out throw it out we tore figures open and we threw the packaging out we threw boxes right, exactly. out without a second thought most of us just threw the box out and went well it's it's garbage you know that's you're not supposed to keep it you're it's the, all about the toy and so that's why we look back and we go, oh, these precious things survived the disposable decade. And uh, that comment makes me think of uh, every time I see someone with selling carded toys, uh, a carded snake eyes, a carded storm shell that they recently, you know, picked up off of, of Craigslist, Facebook, whatever. I like to, personally, I like to know how did that survive so long in card? Yeah. You know what I mean? Did someone buy that for their kid and like, oh, I'll give it to little Bobby here for Christmas and I'll put it in this closet and then forget about it for 40 years. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, to me, the story behind how that toy survived is almost as fascinating as the toy itself. Yeah, because most people didn't. I, I I didn't keep a single Joe a mint on card. I, it never crossed my mind or any toy, any other toy for that matter either. One of the few boxes I kept was my Power Master Optimus Prime box. And the only reason I kept that was because I took such good care of my first prime and I always regretted, oh, I should have kept this box too. Like I, so that was my second chance at like, okay, now keep this box. Cause, uh, you know, I just had, I thought ahead and I thought maybe one day when I'm old, uh, older, I won't want to play with this toy. I want to put him in a box and just, uh, put him on a shelf. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, so that's why I kept that particular box but um i i did hear one story from uh eric good friend eric who uh said his mom would uh put uh, birthday or christmas presents in the top of a closet and she totally forgot about one one year and it was a, a mint on card vintage, vintage star wars figure and all those years later here you go you know forgot to give it to you can you imagine like oh this is like 10 or 15 years old 20 years i, old. I remember it I remember that. I think that was one of your toy uh, toy talks with him, and I remember yeah. thinking the exact same thing in my head. I'm like, "Wow, man! If my mom were to hand me like you know that carded figure all these years later, like oh, I forgot I bought this for you like 40 years ago, and I, you know, here you go. I, it's amazing. It's such know? a powerful, awesome feeling, and I think that's why as vintage toy collectors, we're always looking for those original mint on box cards because we want. It's not just the toy, but we want the the specialness surrounding how this thing survived all these years. Like a mint on card Silverhawks figure, or a mint in box Brave Star figure, or a mint in box Centurions. It's like how in 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 the decade where things were ripped open and played with and played till they were smashed to pieces, that makes you know these little lone survivors so much more special. Um, that they, they evaded the destruction and, and all the wear and tear. And they're still, it's like traveling back in time. You get to have a perfect condition, brand new toy. It's not a reissue. It's it's exactly how they made them back in the old days. It's the exact same thing. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of great points that you just brought up on that. It really is. And uh, I don't know, like I said, it's, yeah, there is something very novelty about, you know what I mean? It, it, or magical that brings you back when you hold a toy like that in the package, I mean, you can see it loose or like a loose cherry on, but when I see one uh, in package carded, which I don't have any in a card or a box, but when I do get to see one, I I'm instantly brought back to 1986, wherever it was, uh, yep. when I was that little kid looking up on that top shelf at like, uh, you know, the discount store Refco that we had at the time staring at him i'm like i couldn't even reach that shelf to get to him you know what i mean and it was just it's an instant you know what i mean me, you know memories unlocked yeah do you do you have any of the the really rare centurion stuff like the from the i guess it's considered the second wave um swing shot traumatizer those guys yeah I have, yeah you have c-bat yeah 
I got feedback, um, and I learned the hard way that the hoses ain't that pliable. Uh oh! <laughs> right off the bat, I, I didn't know that. I was able to get replacements. I was able to get replacements, Nate. You know, what I mean, luckily, uh, but at a you know at a very affordable price. But yeah. yeah, I got them. That was all part of that lot that I mentioned earlier, oh, where man. I went down to work. Traumatizer was in there with the box. Sea bat was in there. Um, uh, slingshot was in there with the box. Uh, I, I like. I got lucky, you know what I mean, on that one. That was, that was my one in a million toy find out as a collector. Absolutely, uh, I had one similar to that. I was searching for all the Silverhawks. I wanted to build my Silverhawks collection, and they hadn't quite gotten as expensive as they are now, but they still were vintage toys, and they weren't that cheap. And so I was trying to find. You know, there's so many of them when you're trying to build a, a complete collection. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And after so much time, one popped up on eBay. And it was just a person, you know, I'm done with this. I don't care. I need the money. And they put everything up. It was the Mirage. It was um, Monstar and his uh, uh, Skyrunner. It was the Silverhawks, all, all, you know, five of them and, and some of the monsters too. After I got that, it, there were very few left to, to collect, you know, to complete the collection. But getting that one... Um, for a really great price that was like whoo because if i hadn't found that that day on ebay probably to this day i wouldn't have an entire shelf dedicated to silverhawks but that's, that's a that's that's a that's a that's a great lot to find right there what you just described that's you know that's amazing um, what about uh, uh you get, go ahead i was about to ask you did you ever get the uh, ultrasonic quicksilver or is that like the only one you don't have in the collection no that's the uh that's the white whale of the silverhawks line way too expensive i'd never drop that much money and it's kind of funny that's what i like about toy collecting what is he like 300 bucks or something like that and uh, last i heard around 400 or something wasn't he? 400 so, so it's still like well under a grand and uh you know for anyone else like car collectors um people who work on their vin uh classic cars or even you know uh, sports fans, you know, you pay so much for your sporting uh, equipment and stuff. But uh, toy collecting seems to be for the frugal people because like four hundred dollars, no way. Um, you know, in any other world, they'd be like four hundred dollars. What's the big deal? I mean, I you know, people pay much more than that for your for their game systems and stuff. But I didn't get ultrasonic Quicksilver. I did sort of get a compromise though because I I wanted that sculpt, just didn't want didn't need the vintage one for that price so i ended up getting a custom one that i think looks better uh it's, so it's a recast it, like very very it wasn't like a, a repro you know big law uh law line of them production run of them it's not like the guy did a hundred of them or anything i think he did like he does them individually he recasts them and hand paints them so i got one that's all silver which i think looks better than the one with the black arms and legs so i do have uh, an ultrasonic quicksilver sort of for a much i think i know exactly what you're talking about and yeah. who you got it from and i i've seen the silver one and it is beautiful it it's, really is it's the one it should be so it it looks great i'm glad that i had sort of have them and i'm also extremely happy that i didn't pay 400 dollars for him because he's not worth it not in my no. opinion he's the only one i need for the figures and i'm not no I, I didn't even know he existed until about 15 years ago so i have no childhood emotional connection to him so yeah i, I don't need him There's don't, no, it doesn't bother me same here no nostalgia and plus i already have a quicksilver and and honestly i think the original quicksilver looks better than ultrasonic quicksilver it just you know, I, I only think i'll give ultrasonic quicksilver credit for because didn't he have the pull down visor yeah like a little flip up visor or whatever on the face yeah that is cool all, all uh, of the I'll ultrasonics. give that figure credit for that one, you know? <laughs> yeah, the Steel Wheel Ultrasonic has that too. So that is cool. And and that's how I've been displayed. So I got the one Quicksilver, the original, who doesn't have a mask, and then the the uh, recast of the Ultrasonic one with the mask down. That does look cool. Uh, what about uh, over back to Centurion's uh, John Thunder and Rex Charger? Do you have prototypes uh, of those guys? I, no, I do not. One of the admins in my group, uh, Mark, he does have the Rex Charger, mm. and uh, I've got to see that thing in person. A uh, you know one of the test production runs where it was painted a a in full color, and the plastic still glows in the dark on it. Oh, cool! Which is I was just I was just about to ask that. That would have been one of the coolest glow in the dark toys ever, Rex Charger. 
Absolutely. I've seen pictures of collections of people that only buy glow in the dark toys. And that would have just, that would probably, you know, that would be uh, a great addition to any one of those collections. It was a beautiful figure. And, uh, the figure wasn't even sonic welded either. So you were able to take it apart and look at the insides and the little, and, and all that. And it was really interesting to see how they improved some of the, uh, I, I think it was the leg ratchets and the, uh, the leg hit ratchets, whatever on the legs, the assembly, they, they tweaked them a little bit for on um, those two figures. Uh, oh, you know cool. what I mean? They tweaked them a little bit. So it would, if they, the line would have continued, they would have been a little more, they definitely would have been more durable. And, uh, uh it's great to see that. <laughs> That's cool to hear because the first three guys, I love them, but they couldn't be worse. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't have deep proof them. Like there's so little motion in their arms and legs and they're so fragile. So um, they definitely had to do something about those arms and legs joints. They're just, they break so easily. Oh, definitely. And uh, Toy Ploy, he did a great deal on how to right. how to fix the arms years ago with the screw. I mean, you get to see how tiny that peg was to hold the arms. You're like, wow, how this many survived? You know, what I yeah, mean? it's it's shocking. Yeah, seeing that video makes me very cautious whenever I move anything on those figures because I I never even thought like when I first got them, you know, da -da 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 -da, power extreme. And now after seeing that video, I go, oh, oh. <laughs> and I've and I've had like one break. Uh, and that's like, oh no, that, that really, and they're unrepairable unless you do the toy play, you take it all apart and put the screw and stuff. It's not as easy as a GI Joe where you just replace a, a band with, you know, a regular screwdriver. Exactly, man. They, they, they're, uh, they're fragile, that's for sure. And, uh, let me ask you now, a lot of people always wonder why the line didn't do as well. And, uh, one of the topics keeps getting brought up that I've noticed is the scale. What do you think about the scale on those toys? Like, uh, you know, their size? Um, I think it, the, the same issue was with Bravestar. Uh, when you spend that many years playing with G.I. Joes, and then a lot of kids before G.I. Joes, Star Wars, same scale. Star Wars and G.I. Joe, same scale. Uh, and then Transformers come along. They're not that much bigger. A little bit, you know, here and there. But there were the Minibots, which were Joe scaled. The aerial bots were Joe scaled. So toys were generally about this this size. Like we had just gotten so used to G.I. Joe's. Um, as soon as you muck with that, start playing around with that, it's like they're not compatible. They're outsiders. We don't want them here. And I think that just turned off a lot of people. Plus being so much bigger is going to be so much more expensive. So Centurions and Bravestar, I think the same thing sunk them. They're just too big and too expensive. That's what I think. They, they were pricey for back in the day. That is for sure. And if you, think, what was it? and if you make it half the size, then you get, th or, uh, you could make three characters out of instead of one character. So instead of one Max Ray, Hasbro made uh, Beachhead, Sci-Fi, and Low Light. Now you tell a kid, you want Max Ray or do you want Beachhead, Sci-Fi, and Low Light? Most kids are gonna go, give me those three Joes. Right. Instead of Agreed. the one guy over here who doesn't move that well, you know, again, like even apart from the character aspect of it might break. It's like it's it's a lot of money to drop on. You certainly felt like you got more bang for your buck with G.I. Joe, I think. I'm going to have to agree as an adult collector. Oh, I love the size. They just it, it yeah. really adds to the display. But yeah, now as a kid. Yeah, like it, uh, yeah, it, for, it, it limited my fun because you you couldn't bring in any. I call it the supporting characters. Like for me, G, playing GI Joes, my Star Wars figures were supporting characters. They were like the, the town civilians, the scientists that Cobra would kidnap. You know what I mean? Yeah. They added to the play of the play value of GI Joe. With Centurions, well, there is no figure you could substitute as a Crystal King. It wasn't gonna happen. Or a scientist that they had to rescue from Doc Terry. You, you didn't have anyone. That's you right. Know? You couldn't even use a Barbie because they're not 12 inch. They're just in this weird no man's land scale. They're not Joe's size. They're not Barbie sized. Ken doll size. They're they're Mego sized, sort of. But they're so much thicker than Mego. They don't even really go with Mego either. But at the time, Mego, if I remember correctly, Mego was already done and out of business. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, Mego wasn't even really technically around anymore unless you go to flea markets and you find dollar bins or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. I totally agree with you, though. Um, like, as an adult, they're awesome. So, 
as we get older, we grow, we get bigger, and the Joes seem so much smaller than we remember them. But then you can have a Brave Star figure or a Centurion or Rambo or Cops and go, wow, cool. And those are so much more fun to play around with as an adult. You know, as a kid, maybe they were bigger and more awkward. But now as an adult, it's it's like that Black Series of Star Wars, of uh, G.I. Joe everyone wants, right? They should Whoa. do a Black Series, Black Series. It's like, well, you know, they did some Black Series back in the 80s. Rambo was kind of a Black Series of G.I. Joe. And Centurions was kind of a Black Series of, I guess, a combination of Lego and Star Wars. You, you had the sci-fi element, but you also had to build it and put it together and put it in whatever combination you want aspect to it. Isn't it amazing how many times that that comes up? Black Series, G.I. Joe. It's like, Hasbro, are you listening? We want it. <laughs> well, they're you listening. Know? They're listening. It's coming. It's coming. Absolutely. I I believe 100% it's coming. I'm sure the question is just when. You know what I mean? It's just, a, you know. It's going to be. I'm sure it'll happen. It's going to be in tan <clears throat> tandem with the movie, the Snake Eyes movie. So when the Snake Eyes movie comes out, there'll be the Snake Eyes merch, obviously, that comes with it. But there'll be all the retro the vintage style merch along with it to try to uh, reinvigorate people's passion. Hey, you remember GI Joe? Remember how much you loved it? Well, this new movie is going to kind of be like that. And, and I, I think that's when we're going to see it. Well, let's just hope they give it the same respect that they gave it to the Star Wars black series, where it was yeah. just the character that we know and love and saw and all the details just brought enlarged. You know what I mean? For, uh, that series you know no tweaks no let's change the best let's change that you know what i mean so yeah hopefully to give it the same love and respect and if they do i will definitely be asking hasbro where should i make the direct deposit out of my paycheck for you exactly know? Direct, direct direct money transfer and uh, they need to call up carson over at 3d joe's and get whatever they they need to get from him the original card art because apparently they don't have it anymore but uh, get Carson involved, get that original card art, and put it in some resealable clamshells so that we can open it and then seal it back up again. Uh, and his work is amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and put a, a 3D Joe's on the package and just say, you know, this is... Because the, the card art is important. It's special. And uh, the 25th anniversary art was nice, but... Over the years, the more you look at it, the more you realize that's not the original artwork. It's a nice homage, no. but it's it's not the original stuff. I caught that right away back in 05. I'm like, wait a minute. This version one snake? Look at the boots. This ain't right. You yeah. know what I mean? I caught that a lot on all those. But yeah. The single pocket. It, it was close. You know? The single pocket on Flint. It's like, yeah, it's it's close enough. Uh, and it was, it was close enough for the anniversary series. For a Black Series, I don't think it's close enough. I think for a Black Series, we need... Or or, or a, re, um, a reissue line of the original figures. It's it won't be close enough. It needs to be just or you know, it needs to be that that original uh, artwork. Even if they could find like an original figure and just scan it, take a picture of it. But uh, I think the best bet is just to go to Carson because he's already got all the the stuff uh, collected there. All the resources are there. I was about to say, I know Hasbro has some of the original artwork because back in when JoeCon was held in Rhode Island, they had it on display, some of the original artwork. And uh, unless that was reproduction, I, I'm trying to remember, actually. I know they had some of the artwork on display, and uh, there was an acknowledgement that Hasbro has a vault where they keep a lot of, like, toys that they made for, you know, for future references. And, yeah. uh, you know, in the vault, supposedly... The story is from the curator himself that there was like three flags in that vault stacked <laughs> on top of each other, and the bottom ones buckled, ready to explode. Oh. You know? They did keep their product, you know what I mean? A lot of it they kept. You know, I, I really couple. hope I hope that vault is waterproof because from the story that Carson told on Toy Guys Talking a while back, they lost a lot of that artwork because of flooding, because of water damage. There's a fire and then water damage. The same thing too, you know. Yeah. It's, that's a shame too. That really is. Yeah, but luckily, like we're we're living in the digital age, so you don't have to have the original. I mean, um, a digital scan of it is is fine. Like as as long as we've got the image and scan, and we they can do things like Carson has done: clean it up, blow it up, even improve. You know, not not it's not necessarily a George Lucas special edition style of thing where we're gonna change it, we're gonna make it better. No, no, just you know. Play with the contrast a little bit, the vibrance, leave the image, 
alone. It's fine the way it is. You can just punch it up a little bit. I mean, like I said, his work is phenomenal. What he has done for the G.I. Joe and the toy community is just, it's amazing. And that man has true love from all the interviews I've seen and watching him talk online and all that. You can tell there's true love in that, you know, for that line that he has, you know, it's, it's a passion, you know. Absolutely. And you've got a true love for Centurions, and I thank you for that. So uh, we're at about an hour here. Uh, we're going to wrap up this portion of it. We're going to keep talking. Toy guys keep talking on Patreon, but... I want to thank you for all of your passion for Centurions because I think a big reason why I love Centurions as much as I do is because everything that you've contributed to the Centurions community with the Facebook group uh, and just your your constant uh, passion and enjoyment of it, it just, it makes me keep enjoying it as well. I appreciate you saying that, but I'd like to also, if if it's all right, you know, two of my admins, Anthony and Mark, they... They've contributed. Uh, they, they their contribution with a lot of the behind the scenes info that they added on. It's really they they, you know, they help make that you know a, a great place for collectors to come and visit. You know, awesome. So, so I, I just had to give them some thanks on that one. Big thanks to them as well. So anyone else out there, if you're a Centurions fan or if you don't know anything about uh, Kenner's Centurions Power Extreme and you want to know more, you'll definitely want to check out the Facebook group. Just go on Facebook and search for Centurions. Uh, I think it, it's Centurions Power Extreme is all I put on there. You know yeah. What I mean? So it should come up right away. Centurions is one of the harder things to search for because it's such a common thing. And anytime I search for Centurions, everything but the toy line comes in. So I have to search 1986 <laughs> Centurions or Kenner Centurions or Power Extreme. It's too bad that it's not as specific as Brave Star with two R's or Inhumanoids. No. Um... I, I, I hate to interrupt, but uh, you know, because we have you know approval for members to join, and I will look at members and be like things in common or what groups they're in, and Roman archaeology, and, and it's Aww. like, yeah, I'll send a message like, you know, this is a toy then, right? Right. This right. Is, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, historic, you know, Roman centurions, and they're like, oh, oh, okay, never mind. For, you know, delete my request. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So they're not even looking. Lot. <laughs> they're not even looking what they're joining. They just do like a mass join thing. Yeah, they seem Roman gladiator or something like that. So, well, uh, it's been awesome chatting with you. We're gonna keep going, like I said, over on Patreon. Uh, but uh, we're gonna wrap this one up for now. So I just want to give you a big thanks, and everyone else out there, uh, definitely check out the Centurions Power Extreme group on Facebook. Thanks everyone for watching. Big thanks, Nick, for the chat. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me to come on. And everyone else out there, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, third mistake. And give me a power, power extreme. extreme.